And so my name is Kendall House, and I'm a clinical assistant professor in anthropology at Boise State University, where I teach the UX research program. Uh, we have both an undergraduate and a graduate program, and it's good to see some people from both of those here. And our guest today is Joe Eichen, okay. uh, who's a business and design anthropologist who helps leaders innovate, create, build, and launch transformative technologies. And I decided she has it so good on LinkedIn, I was just going to use her LinkedIn um, account. And, and she does this, her work, because she's obsessed with culture and sees culture everywhere in anything and everything. Let's come down here just a bit. Currently, uh, Dr. Eichen is a senior UX researcher at Google, um, where she's been for about a year. Prior to that, she was a research fellow at University College London. And I think this was your dissertation research, is that correct, Joe? She was at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration for three and a half years. Yeah. And partly what they were working on there is Mars analogs. Right, correct. Good, and so <laughs> she's going to be speaking today about the full run of her career uh, from her dissertation research with NASA, uh, leading to her work uh, doing uh, user research at Google. And hopefully we can learn more about what she does at Google, which is sometimes a mystery to those of us outside of Google. We know that they, they employ a great many user researchers, um, but we're not as clear maybe just what it's about and what you do there. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Eichen and let her take it from there. Great. Thank you. This is like a lesson, I guess, for everyone. And I'm glad um, that my LinkedIn is up to date <laughs> um, because you never know when people are going to use it. So I'm going to share some slides and don't worry, don't be um, scared. It's just to show you some really cool pictures because people like looking at space pictures. So it's pretty cool. Anyway, well, um, thank you so much for having me and asking me to speak to you guys. I'm very happy um, to speak about astronaut anthropology. It's pretty much been my life for probably about the last 20 years. Um, even though I've transitioned um, to work at Google, it's still very much a part of the way I approach things and the things I still do um, on a daily basis. So I'm going to mostly talk about NASA in space because that's um, usually what's the most, most interesting. Um, I have worked at NASA for a very long time. Um, prior to my work, um, my thesis and then my dissertation work, um, I worked there, um, actually started interning when I was about 15. Um, so it's been a whole lifelong journey there. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. Then, of course, I'll talk about my work as an anthropologist in NUX um, and the human research program, um, and then also in human resources, which was a very different transition. I'll talk about a little bit more. And then and that culminated in my um, postdoctoral work um, before I came to Google. So. Um, like I said, I've been working at NASA for a very long time. This is actually a picture for me when I was a teenager. Don't judge the hair. And yeah, you can probably start to date me because <laughs> looking at the computers and things in this photo. Um, I started out working um, in mission control. I studied aerospace engineering first um, when I was at university at Texas A&M um, because I thought that's how you got to NASA. And I always wanted to work at NASA. I always wanted to um, be an astronaut, do something in the space industry. And I thought the only way you could do that was to be an engineer. So that's what I started working on. Um, learned very quickly. I was not really cut out to be an engineer, um, but didn't really know what I was going to do. So while I was at NASA, um, originally initially working in mission control, um, is when, unfortunately when we lost the Space Shuttle Columbia. And I had a really unique opportunity to work with the investigation board for that accident. And that was the first time I heard about the word in ethnography. And it, was, it wasn't even from anthropologists. The, this was a consultant group, for, um, mostly made up of psychologists. But they had us doing um, ethnography of 
basically leadership at NASA as part of the Columbia um, accident investigation. So I didn't really know I was going to do my, my life, but I kind of liked the process, the idea of going around and observing and interviewing and, you know, everything that ethnography, um, you know, teaches you how to do with that kind of toolkit. So I just started researching and figured out, hey, anthropologists do that. That's kind of where it started. So went to school and studied anthropology. Then came back to NASA and um, worked first um, in UX at um, in the human health and performance group or space human factors and habitability element. Um, my job title wasn't UX. That's what we kind of referred to ourselves as. Um, and this was, of course, like, oh gosh, 20 years ago, maybe when I don't even think UX was very well used. It definitely was not a job title. Um, and actually still is not a, a legitimate, um, I guess a legitimate, like actually on the books um, for NASA as a job title. Um, but there are definitely people who do UX and refer to themselves and might even see business cards and LinkedIn profiles that say UX. Um, but it's not still considered to be a, a for real um, air quotes um, job title, which is is not completely unheard of. I know, of course, and we all probably know being in UX, you're starting to see that um, job title pop up a lot more and more. But anyway, when I started out, it was not a job title. Um, but basically what we did was we did research. We worked on um, risks that had been identified to human spaceflight. Um, this is just kind of a, this shows a, a human research roadmap is basically what your life is like as a UX researcher at NASA is you gather evidence, you know, from space flights, from research findings that um, identify these, these risks to human space flight. Um, and then it's narrowed down to a gap. So let's say, obviously, we know that um, living in space is really difficult on the body. We know that you have to live in a contained environment. So that a risk would be that kind of hospitable environment. A gap in knowledge might be how long um, can you stay in a really small confined environment um, and function well as a team? You know, that, that could be a gap of knowledge we don't really know much about. And then there are tasks that identify to that. Okay, well, if we know that this is a gap, how can we go and find this out? So what some of the tasks might be looking at analogs of human spaceflight and studying teams in those environments. And then of course you do your report and, and it, it's a circular iterative process. So this is what I did for about, I guess, seven years. I'm working in UX, again, not UX, but um, as a UX researcher. And my primary job at the time was looking at inadequate vehicle and habitat design. Um, I worked on um, mostly space station evidence-based um, research. So basically, things that we were learning about living on space station we were taking some of those um, findings and then trying to apply them to what it would be like for life on Mars. So if we know that, there, that you know, something like personal um, space or crew quarters um, can be kind of a, a sticky issue on space station, well, what's that gonna be like on Mars? So that was kind of my um, niche little area that I worked on was um, crew quarters. Um, I worked on that for about two or three years. And oh, I'm not being able to, oh, I have to turn the ball. Caption thing, y'all. Sorry about that. So oh, let me turn. All right. Anyway, so um, this actually evolved into my master's thesis. Um, I was really fortunate where I could use my day to day work to work that into my master's thesis. Um, so it wasn't working on like, you know, several different things at a time. Um, but developed this work into my master's um, looking at privacy and habitat design. So this is um, again my uh, master's in anthropology at University of North Texas very much an applied program, so that worked out great. Um, I did just like I did on my in my everyday job. I looked at different um, analogs for space flight. So one of those being um, offshore um, drilling, offshore um, platforms where people might go and live for a while or go and live for a certain amount of time. It's still 
close quarters. They also use um, submarines um, to go down into the water and, and work on the drilling platforms underneath the water. And that's a very, very closed environment um, to look at how teams function. Other things like Antarctica, that's a huge one for us, um, looking at how scientific expeditions, you know, and how people manage to live, you know, for wintering over in Antarctica, where you can't just go outside just, you know, as easily as you can, you know, maybe at home. And um, so gathering evidence from all of these different situations and applying them back to a habitat for Mars. And then I had the opportunity to stay in an actual analog for Mars as one of the first crews for the HERA project, which is Human Exploration Research Analog. It's just an acronym for the name of the analog in this photo. And um, that was actually on site at NASA here in Houston. And that was really fun. As an anthropologist, that was the best way to be embedded and, and to um, actually do ethnography from within, which is very rare in space um, research. As you can imagine, we can't go to space, so we have to learn and, and utilize different methods um, for doing ethnography. So living on board or living, sorry, inside an analog is very different. Um, it's kind of like camping, but just, you know, with three people you never knew. Um, before and it's very interesting. And uh, so one of the other projects uh, I worked on after um, I completed the privacy and space and, and habitat design project, started working in robotics. And this was actually kind of one of those things that evolved out of that research, um, starting to look at not just human teams in a confined environment, but a human robotic team. In a, in a closed environment, especially for Mars, I was particularly interested in anthropomorphic robots. Um, so we were thinking 40 years in the future, what would that um, be like? How can we start developing those things now, which NASA is already and has been doing for quite a while, looking at anthropomorphic robots and seeing what they're capable of, seeing how they work with um, the human crew members in, on the International Space Station. This is actually a couple of photos of Valkyrie. Um, she is um, able to walk and as well as use her arms as Robonaut can. Robonaut um, does have legs, but he doesn't, he doesn't walk. He's not designed for gravity environment. He's designed to work on the International Space Station. Valkyrie is designed to work on Mars. Originally it was to work on Mars. She has other um, applications of that as well, asteroids, the moon. And the idea is that robots like these could help do the things that astronauts can't do safely. Um, so it's very, very cool to start to see, even though this is like probably way in the future, even though of course we hope to be in Mars and the moon much sooner than 40 years, but this is something that um, probably is a little bit further down even once we get there. Other analogs for robotics include um, the robotic arm that's on the space station, looking at seeing how people on the ground are interacting with those robotic um, apparatuses on, in, in space. So studying people on the earth and how they um, are already interacting with robotic and, and forming a robotic team um, that's both terrestrial and in space. Just some cool photos of people using robots and of course um, anything you know, digital analogs um, and virtual reality is a huge part of this as well. You can kind of see as an anthropologist, sometimes we can, we just keep going further and further and further. And at some point you have to say, okay, this is enough. But um, there, you know, you start with something very simple like human robotic teams and it, you can go as far and as wide as you, as you can possibly imagine in terms of, you know, finding those kind of analog situations. Um, other analogs include not just, um, you know, anthropomorphic robots and the robots that exist in virtual reality, but also rovers. Like we forget sometimes um, that rovers are considered to be robots. And I say we forget this. One of the questions that I ask all my participants um, in doing this study was, you know, what do you consider to be a robot? What's your definition of a robot? And it's really interesting to see how often we don't really consider robots or things with wheels to be these kind of robots. We tend to think more, of, you know, like what we see in science fiction. Um, but these are very much robots. They are even autonomous to a larger degree than some of the other robotics I was showing. And of course, Robonaut that is on space station right now can do quite a bit um, of 
the different day-to-day -day stuff for astronauts, although um, it's still very much in the infancy, the idea is that, to let Robonaut do more. Um, but unfortunately, funding for robotics is one really expensive and not as well supported um, as other functions. So I had intended this to be my PhD thesis um, into robotics, but because of the work um, that I was doing at NASA got was actually, um, the funding was paused during my PhD. I had to look elsewhere for a project and that brings me to human resources. Um, again, I was, I was a student, I was a grad student um, during this time, but I was also a full-time civil servant employee for NASA. And um, as NASA does, sometimes they just reassign you to places if your projects aren't being funded or you're looking to do certain work. Sometimes they just send you somewhere else. And I got sent to human resources. And I honestly thought it was kind of a joke when that happened um, because I worked in human um, factors. They sent me to human resources. I thought it was a typo, um, but it wasn't. Um, I was actually part of the Presidential Management Fellows Program at this time. And this was considered to be a rotational um, opportunity for me, it turned out to be full time. And it wasn't actually as bad as I thought. It was kind of cool. I got to work in a, a completely new area for me that was organizational development. And as a anthropologist, I was doing the same sort of stuff. I was just applying it differently. I was still doing ethnography. I was still doing UX like work, but for me this time, it was more service design. I was helping design leadership programs. I was learning more about the leadership at NASA, working at different centers, I'm working at headquarters. And I was still su supporting the same mission control center that I, that I grew up in, um, just from a different perspective. Um, I was still working on technologies, um, but it was from a different, for a different purpose. It was for helping to develop leaders, um, not necessarily to develop astronaut skills, um, but it was it was still to help astronauts. So it was really interesting. Um, one of the first, one of the coolest projects I work on was during the selection for astronauts in 2017, which actually started in 2016. It was the first time NASA had used an online application program. So if you think if you're applying for jobs right now or looking for a job, you go online and fill an application. Well, NASA was still using mailing mailed in applications in prior to 2016. And so this was the first time we developed something online. I mean, it sounds kind of like it should have already been happening, but for something that's this high profile, there are certain risks that come along with um, having something online based. So this was very much a UX kind of project. Um, and it was really interesting to see how that developed within the government parameters that so many safety restrictions and privacy restrictions on astronaut applications it took a couple of years to develop, um, but now it's being used and it's, it's really cool. Um, so this all led and culminated into my PhD, which turned out not to be on robotics, but was very much a classic ethnography of of astronauts. It was basically astronaut culture, but with kind of a future view. So the idea that how astronauts are being selected and trained and work at NASA, they work at NASA in Houston, they work at different centers, they come from different universities. I have Steve Swanson here from Boise State. That's a, that's a picture of him there on the right. And how, you know, their, their upbringing, their their training as an employee turns them in to this idea of, of a Martian or the future Martians, people who will live on Mars first, um, perhaps should be or could be um, astronauts. So they can be from different countries. They can, of course, now we know they, they can be from different companies. Um, but the idea that somewhere they're an employee, they're employee for somebody. And it was a not, you know, very much techie kind of PhD, but, you know, as a PhD, so it was very, um, very academic, very ethnic, ethnographic um, look at that. Although I did, was able to use some of the findings and apply it back to some of the leadership programs for it, specifically for the astronauts. And here's just some pictures of cool astronaut things because, it, and in Houston, there are very specific things um, designed for astronauts. They have their own parking spaces. They have their home planes they can use. Um, so all of these things help, you know, build part of that culture. 
And then, of course, um, this um, PhD research fed over into what is um, known as ethno-ISS or ethnography of the International Space Station, which this is a very large um, project. It is conducted in five different countries and sponsored by the European Research Council and um, University College London. And I was a postdoc on this project under Dr. Victor Bookley, who was um, my boss and also my advisor through my PhD. Um, and so it basically is we have as anthropologists, sorry, at um, several different space centers around the globe, um, all conducting an ethnography of the International Space Station. So this was a five year project. My, I spent two years um, doing this until I was recruited by Google where I have been for almost a year now. And this is kind of odd that I'm ending on my introduction because I've talked about all of the you know, astronaut um, and NASA stuff, um, which was done in, as an anthropologist, but could also, you could, every time I've said anthropology, you could probably replace that with UX because it's, it's UX work. Um, and that's what I do now full-time, senior UX, I actually do have a UX um, job title a senior UX researcher at Google. Um, but I've also done other things um, outside of NASA. I've worked for Southwest Airlines doing customer insights research. Again, UX, that was another one where UX was very much not um, part. It was part of the lingo, but it wasn't part of our job titles yet. Um, so with all of that said, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have some resources up here. I'll send you all a copy of the slides if you want to look at them. But there's loads of podcasts and resources out there for careers um, from anthropology to UX. And I apologize for speaking just on anthropology, but that's what I know. Um, and as far as I know, UX research and anthropology um, are a great marriage and um, pretty much these resources I'm sharing with you, I think would be useful for anybody, not even just anthropologists, but all UX researchers um, and designers as well, because designers tend to do some research. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Joe. And I think we're a small enough group uh, that if you have a question, uh, you, you can probably, and we'll just otherwise, uh, I think, you know, again, we're small enough, you can kind of just wave your hand just slightly and start talking. So Jalisa. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Joe, for uh, taking the time to present to us today. I kind of had a question about, um, you know, the comparison between the investment in that time to gather all those slow ethnographic details at NASA versus at Google in a completely different industry, it's kind of B2C. Um, how would you compare that investment in, in that method? Yeah, so um, I could probably talk about a different couple of different ways too, because it's not just at NASA the slow work. Um, there's it's almost like it should be academic versus applied in a way, because in, and at NASA, you know, it's my job to do ethnographic um, research too, and some of those projects were really fast. Like some of our robotics projects were three weeks or less, and even by Google standards, that's pretty fast. Um, you know, some of my Google projects take, oh gosh, six months. And you think, oh my gosh, that's crazy for industry. I think it depends on your project and depends on, you know, what you're working on, of course. Um, but I think, and of course, academic, that's where you have much, much longer time. And that classic ethnography, what I meant by that when I was talking about my PhD, that was kind of, to me, that's the longer. It was, you know, two years of ethnographic evidence. And in terms of, you know, just like, I guess, the quality or time investment, um, I'm surprised, and I'm still constantly surprised, even when I do a short project, the, um, if, if your methods are rigorous and, you know, you, you're applying what you've been trained in as an ethnographer, I'm still amazed at the quality you can get from a short ethnography compared to a long one are so similar. I mean, it really is. I mean, I've, having had, you know, the really long projects and then the really short projects, you can still get some really good meaty stuff out of those short projects. Thank you. That's been kind of one slight maybe concern for me is um, having these case studies where the projects have been very short and worrying about just presenting them and having companies say, well, how useful is this data? How can you 
prove that this was useful. Yeah, I, I would like to say something else too. And then this is kind of a difference maybe t- between NASA and industry and not just Google, but other industry experience that I've had. You know, at NASA, I tended to work more with academics, more PhDs, psychologists mostly. Um, and so reporting my findings, they were looking for more of that in-depth stuff. Now in industry, even though there are other PhDs and other researchers, they, they tend to be more excited about even things we might consider to be small. I'm not saying that it's small, but, you know, you can hand them a couple of golden nuggets and they're like excited, you know, they're just, just as excited as if you handed them a 200 page, you know, document that highlighted 20 major themes and blah, blah, blah. So I've kind of learned over the years too. It's like, I might not think I'm handing them a lot, but they're so excited when they get it. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. I have a question, Joe. Um, so you and I met because we, you were a presenter at the Epic People Conference and you did a really incredible workshop on um, analogs. And since, you know, like I've gotten a little bit of UX experience under my belt, um, I have started to notice a link between analogs and storytelling. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the link between analogs and storytelling. Um, I think, do you mean in terms of like presenting your work back or analog? Yeah. So, yeah. So sort of like, yeah, delivering findings and um, especially in the capacity where you're, like you said, doing like robotics and NASA and, um, and these like habitat analogs. I'm really curious about what your personal experience is. Yeah. And you just have to let me know if I, if I get this right or not, (laughs) um, for me, like, when I think of analogs, um, I use the term analogs and that kind of came out of, you know, I worked as an engineer or say engineering, grew up very much in an engineering organization. I still work in an engineering organization. And that is kind of one of those terms. that's part of that culture. Um, as anthropologists who have never worked with engineers, we might actually use the word storytelling and meaning the same thing. Um, if we're talking about reporting our findings out. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'm giving a presentation and I'm talking about how astronauts are like scientists who live in Antarctica and I paint this beautiful picture in storytelling. And and that's one way to kind of capture and, 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 um, the, you know, the, the culture captured the, the things that are important out of that comparison. Right. Um, within analogs or looking at analogs to me what's different from it in terms of storytelling is that I'm actually gathering ethnographic evidence science you know scientific if you want to call it that based I have to be scientifically based I know a lot of a lot of anthropologists follow that um, but for me within the industry that I work in I have to be very scientifically rigorous um, then, you know, I'm actually gathering evidence of that. And then I'm retelling that, you know, and then I can be a storyteller and retell it again, but it's still very evidence-based. So I probably didn't answer your question, <laughs> um, but there, there is kind of this, this idea that they are the same. If I was talking to an anthropologist who didn't know anything about engineering or space, I might not ever use the word analog um, because storytelling, we do that as anthropologists a lot. We use different comparisons, um, for better or for worse. Uh, that totally answered my question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, like, and there's a balance right between mm-hmm. rigor, you know, uh, of the data adhering to your data and then telling that story in a captivating way or in a meaningful way that, um, creates some actionable prescription. Thank you. Um, I, could you guys hear me? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm actually a CWI student, so I don't currently go to um, BSU, but thankfully um, BSU is so great at inviting us back and forth. But I just had a quick question um, about how um, the, in terms of like more of an anthropological perspective, how um, behavior kind of worked in space versus how, cause like I imagine like for like gravity would be kind of a, there's always that 
um, they always joke like that transition when they come back to space or when they go to space. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how like any trends that you saw, um, what were things that were more of an issue that maybe we don't think about and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. So um, there's loads and I think I'll, I would probably have different answers from for you compared to like a um, biomedical or a physical anthropologist because I'm cultural. Um, but there's loads of physical things that happen to the body in space, we know, and then when they come back um, to earth and in terms of the transition, some of the interesting things, and these, some of these things have been published, but to actually look, you know, to, to living and working with them at NASA in Houston, um, taking a little bit further, we're like, there's some reports that have already been out in terms of anthropologists, I'm sorry, astronauts, um, they don't drive for about six months when they come back to space, just because their spatial awareness is off. And we know that's kind of one of those physical things. Um, but some of the things that I noticed and were that went into my ethnography um, was that they dropped their pens a lot, like being in just in a meeting with them. Um, and we're talking like maybe months after um, they've been in space. And of course it depends on how long they've been in space, um, but I'm working mostly now with, of course, station astronauts. So they're, they're up there a lot longer than they used to be. Um, but, you know, just being in a meeting with them and they just keep dropping their pen because in space, they wouldn't need to put it away. They just let it go and float. And so just watching them and drop their pens is hilarious to me. Um, but then they just look different. And this is one of those things too, is it from an anthropological perspective, not even just mine, but asking, you know, other people I work with as part of my ethnography, like, how do you know, how do you spot an astronaut at NASA? They just look different. And sometimes they look sickly. Um, and I would have my people explain what that meant. And like their skin color would look different. Some would say they kind of had a glow. Some would say they just looked kind of gray, which is kind of funny to me. The title of my PhD was making Martians. So the kind of like gray alien, like reference was, was fun for me, but <laughs> they just look different. And what, what that means, um, to, to their coworkers. Um, so th there's loads of things, loads of different, um, human behavior differences in space, just the way they use their bodies. Proprioception is very different in space and is on, on earth because of the um, lack of gravity, uh, or absence of full gravity. So I could go on. <laughs> yeah, no, I am. Um, I'm more interested in cultural as of right now. Um, so I was just excited to kind of hear your perspective. Um, but I love, I mean, there's so many great things in anthropology and they're so interconnected that it's just great mm -hmm. to hear all. So thank you very much. Well, before you get going, Tom, I, I've got a question. So since, since UX has come into wide use, we, we used to call our program uh, design ethnography. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, with everybody else, we started calling it UX research. And you could kind of see that on LinkedIn. But what I noticed is that I have a harder time convincing students that anything ethnographic really matters. Because when they hear UX, they think, device they they're thinking about an app on a device and they're thinking especially about the interface and so there's there's tremendous tendency to reduce ux research to interface design mm -hmm. and so a question you know that i have there is is to, is the work that you do at google as a ux researcher is it interface centric or is it more broad um and more ethnographic in a sense. Yeah, I would, I would just have to say I sympathize totally with um, the, you know, the kind of being frustrated with the reduction of ethnography to interface. And I would say even the reduction of ethnography to usability. And that's something I, I faced, you know, looking at jobs and, and workings. They think all you're going to do is usability testing. And that's great. And I do usability testing in a way, but I do ethnographic usability testing, if, if that's even a thing. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of what I do at Google, um, you could say it's interface. There's part in the, of an interface there. So I work um, on internal products. And I even say I should probably put air quotes around the word products because it's really not even just technologies. It's, it's how 
um, employees work and, and the type of work they have to do. I work internationally, so I work in every country that Google is present. And part of it is learning how those countries talk to each other and work together because we're all part of the same team and we all do the same sort of things. Um, so even though I may there may be an interface there, um, probably because it's COVID and we're still on Zoom. And so, of course, there's an interface of some sort, right? Um, but it's not just, I'm not just making an app. I don't make apps. Um, I make tools for employees. And I don't feel like it's an app. Of course, it depends on what team I'm sure you work at. There are people who work on apps at Google, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I think just the mindset, too, of the app, of the anthropologists I know, and there's quite a few at Google, we don't... Can, we don't feel like it's an I know I'm talking on their behalf, but I'm just my my observation of our conversations is we don't feel that way. It, you don't feel like you're just working on an app. You're you're helping somebody, um, you know, do a better better Google search and get better results or more equitable results um, when they're, they're doing a Google search. So I guess kind of like and I want to use like an example from Southwest Airlines, because this was the first job I did in the industry. Where I was really concerned, I was fresh out of my master's. I was really concerned about just, just being UX and doing usability. And also, you know, I'm working for industry and I don't know, is that bad? You know, I want to be a good citizen. And my boss told me, you know, don't think about it as, and the way he thought about it was like, you don't, don't think about it as like you're helping make somebody money by making their airline better. So, you know, the, they can get more money. Think about it as you're making a mother's flight experience better. You know, you're, you're helping those people who have to commute to work every Monday <laughs> before COVID, obviously <laughs> on a plane, you're making their lives better. You're making that doctor who has to do a rotation across the country, you know, away from his family, you're making his experience better. So he can serve his patients better. So he can connect back to, you know, all it just goes on. Um, so that's kind of something I've always thought about whenever I do start to feel like maybe I'm just working to make somebody rich, <laughs> but, you know, besides myself. Um, <laughs> um, and I think that's, that's very much the, the atmosphere of anthropology, I think, that I've observed so far, at least at Google, is that we feel like we're working for something better. And I, I know I definitely do. I'm fortunate to be on the team that I am on. We actually have four other anthropologists on a team of seven. Don't know how in the world that happened, um, but I'm very fortunate now because I've, I've never worked with other anthropologists. So it's very cool. Um, thank you. And I, I do think that's another issue that comes up is whether or not it's it's commercialized. And, mm -hmm. you know, and what you've said is what I found. I've never met an anthropologist who has a really strong commercial perspective on what they're doing. So mm. real quick, I do want to kind of address the pathways and jobs to NASA. Unfortunately, as in the bad news, there's bad news, good news, right? So um, anthropology, just like UX, anthropology or anthropologists are not um, part of NASA's hiring purview. They are told by the government what degrees they can hire, everything. There's not a specific job title. You will never see that at NASA. Well, I won't say never because I'm actually still working with them um, to get that on the books. Um, but I've been working on that for about five years. So I'll let you know if it happens. But anyway, you can look through different internships. The Presidential Management Fellow Program is one of the best and one of the easiest ways for anthropologists to enter. Um, you do have to be, unfortunately, um, about to graduate with your master's or your PhD. Um, in terms of undergrad pathways, um, the, the best and easiest route to actually do um, work um, would be through a contractor and um, looking through their internships, their jobs, and um, because they are able to hire anthropologists where NASA is not directly at the time. Um, and then as far as like getting analogs, um, getting studies or anything like that, or products being tested within an analog, you can Google NASA and then NASA analogs. Um, and that will come, should bring you up to the HERA website. Um, where you can look on how you apply to have that done. I would say like as an undergrad, um, you would need somebody with a PhD to at least be a PI on any kind of study or any kind of product you might be doing. Um, you would also probably need to, mo more than likely, um, you would need full funding from a university. Um, NASA puts out 
a few calls for proposals um, every year, but those are few and far between and you have to apply and reapply and, and it's just a headache. So if you have full funding, if you have PhDs as a PI, um, that's the best route to go. Well, thank you so much. Uh, great talk. And I'm so glad you were able to find time to visit with us.